a little bit about us and why I'm excited about the opportunity, um, how we've built the team, but also talk a little bit about why I joined, where the future value is, and then spend a significant amount of time on Q&A. Um, because I know all of you probably have questions about um, growing companies and taking them public or getting them exited. Um, as Hubert mentioned, this is my third um, publicly traded company that I've been part of the management team to as CEO and one as chief strategy officer. And uh, I was fortunate enough to start my career um, back uh, when banking and analysts were not separate jobs. And I actually started my career at Montgomery Securities in um, the early to mid 90s. It was a unique time because unlike analysts today or you know, people who collect information, we actually had to call management teams. We actually had to pick up the phone. We actually had to sun, send runners to libraries and cut out articles. And it was a really good way to really think about what information you want to go after. And uh, although today it's so much easier and better. So, you know, there's good and bad to that. So let me tell you first my first key topic about, about Lantern and what we do, why people are excited about it. Um, as you were mentioned, we went public a few weeks ago. Um, we're trading right at well under $100 million. Our investors historically have been BIOS partners out of Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, GPG Ventures out of Dallas. And of course, we were fortunate enough to get some early uh, support from HealthCat Wildcatters. The team has changed a lot, as you were mentioned, since then, uh, really to try to go after uh, the vision that the company founded, which was to use data to rescue oncology drugs. And in fact, the name, you know, not a lot of people know this, but the actual name for Lantern Pharma comes from the very first compound that they in licensed. So LP100, which was a compound called Irofov, and it failed a phase three trial after numerous other trials, I think over three dozen other trials in multiple solid tumors. It eventually was advanced to a phase three trial in pancreatic cancer, and it failed in the shelves for a decade. Uh, actually, less than a decade, seven years. Uh, but the name Lantern Pharma actually comes from that compound, because that compound, LP100, uh, the active ingredient comes from a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Uh, it's called a Ludin S, highly, highly toxic compound. A lot of manufacturers won't even touch it. Um, but the active ingredient for LP100 irofulvin comes from that acylfulvin class of the Ludin S. And so that's actually where the name lantern comes from. Uh, it's from the jack-o'-lantern mushroom. And the vision of the company was to take and assemble a lot of data, genomic data, clinical data, response data, uh, biological data about the drugs, biological interaction data about the drugs and tumors, and identify the mechanisms of action more clearly, and then use AI to really identify the subgroups and do that in a matter of months and weeks and not uh, years. And they believe that this kind of effective targeting could drive a more efficient path to launching the drug back in the clinical setting. And they did exactly that with LP100. Uh, within a year of licensing that drug from the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, they licensed it out to an, a biotech in Europe based on the signature and based on the fact that they found that this drug can work in an orphan population of metastatic hormone refractory prostate cancer, and more importantly, that they could guide the enrollment using a signature. So today, that drug is actively in a phase two trial where a signature, RNA expression signature, is being used to actively guide the enrollment. And why this is important, as I think many of you know, developing an oncology drug is very, very costly, a billion dollars. Even biotechs can take several hundred million dollars. Their success rates are low. But the data that's generated in the process of doing the studies for the drug and also the clinical trial itself, there's a massive amount of data, a massive amount of exhaust in the drug development process. So it's really a perfect problem area for AI and machine learning. And curating this data and analyzing it is really central to developing um, a good process. And of course, this has caught the attention of the trade, like Fortune and Newsweek, and also scientific publications. And so you can see that this data-driven approach is being met with a lot of excitement in the investor community, and also in um, science itself. And in fact, COVID 19, over 80% of the therapeutics, not the vaccines, but the therapeutics are actually repurposed and rescued. And most of the reason why we're able to do this kind of accelerated development is because of in silico modeling and data. 
Why this is critical for the drug development industry, as many of you know, there is a massive need to change the ROI. If you look at the top 12 pharma, this is a study that's put out every year by Deloitte, and they do a very good job of this. Um, so this comes from Deloitte's research. The ROI last year on their internal rate of return for their compounds that are de being developed was 1.8%. That's lower than their cost of capital. So it's really a, a real problem. And it's not because those teams aren't smart. It's not because they don't have good compounds. It really comes down to, in oncology, the fact that these strong, interesting compounds, the therapeutic potential is diluted because of the specific patient group isn't targeted. And secondly, the other reason is that the number of genetic changes involved in cancer development are multiplying so significantly. So uh, really these drugs that are being developed will only work best in a subset of patients. And so the high watermark, obviously, every few years continues to increase. And so you have to have increasingly more stratification and you have to use genetics from day one in development, which a lot of the great biotechs are doing. Companies like Loxo, which sold to Eli Lilly for $8 billion. Ignita, which sold to Roche for $4.5 billion. Um, Blueprint Medicine, which went public a few years ago. So this era of targeted drugs in oncology is really accelerating, but there's a high cost. So what we do, and this is the opportunity, is that our ability is to change the cost curve by capitalizing on some of the other mega trends that are happening. Genomic and biomarker data for cancer has never been as available as it is today. In fact, um, the amount of patient data, real world data, just in the U.S. has increased by close to 50 uh, to 60,000 fold uh, just in the last five years for real world cancer data. Also at the same time, there's more sharing and collaboration globally um, between industry consortiums, research groups, companies, and so there's access to scientific data. And at the same time, you see a massive decrease in the cost of sequencing and the cost of biomarker data acquisition, whether it be from third parties or de novo sequencing efforts. It used to cost thousands of dollars to get full RNA and DNA sequences. Today, that cost uh, is sub $1,000. In fact, um, we pay even sub $500 for our uh, RNA sequencing. And, you know, uh, the cost will continue to drop. So at the same time, because of all this data, and not because the drug development industry developed it, it's other industries. They've evolved AI technologies and machine learning to such an extent that today in mid-2020, we can do things that we couldn't do two and three years ago to data sets. Uh, even in fact, we uh, put out a press release on Monday that uh, we reached over 450 million data points in the company. Uh, all curated data points that are looking at uh, cancer tumor interaction. That's a, an immense amount of data points. And because of that, our algorithms run across the vast majority of those data sets. Uh, and we can actually take algorithms and templates of methodologies that are developed in other industries and implement them on our data sets rapidly. Uh, this was impossible three years ago. And so AI technologies have become cheaper, more accessible, and faster. And so at the core of what we're doing at Lantern Pharma is we are leveraging AI. We're not an AI company. We're not inventing AI. We're really leveraging the best in class AI methods and tools and processes and access to data to develop these drugs, both rescue and de novo development. It's a big industry. We are profiled in Fortune as one of the companies that will transform and be at the forefront of this fundamental shift as uh, drug discovery changes. And I see it very much like in the software industry. You know, the software industry, once cloud and um, team-based processes became more widespread, uh, the whole software industry changed because of that. And it didn't make the industry smaller. It actually exploded. It made it much, much larger, many new opportunities. And I think we're going to see the same kind of shift in our industry. And at the same time, the other massive reason for this shift is everywhere AI has touched, whether it be transportation, fashion, retail, uh, financial services, uh, it has changed the cost curve. In fact, last year I wrote an opinion in the International Business Times really talking about how the next uh, two frontiers where AI needs to change the cost curve is, in fact, uh, drug development and education. These are the only industries over the last 10 and 20 years that have continued to explode in cost. Um, and can be fundamentally transformed uh, with AI. So I believe that you know, it, 
shouldn't cost cancer patients $300,000 to $500,000 or more per drug. And the only way to make that change is to improve the ROI. And the only way to improve the ROI is to have more effective, more efficient uh, drug development, which I think we're at the at a decade where that is going to uh, happen. So um, one of the reasons I'm very excited and we try to focus on a lot of transparency about what we're doing as a company with our platform, because uh, you hear a lot of buzzwords about platforms. In fact, yesterday, um, I'm sure you guys do this as well, I sat in on a 30-minute pitch from a company that was supposedly using AI for information gathering and processing. And I thought, well, this could be really useful because uh, we're trying to gather competitive intelligence on certain compounds and we're trying to gather competitive intelligence on biomarkers and you know it takes hours to do that and I don't want to spend hours doing that maybe this tool can help and so I thought well this is an AI tool it's an interesting new company I sat in on the, on the presentation and um, it's not AI it's just basic search tool and the data had they have they don't actually have the data it's just screen scraping and it's not very good so I really believe in transparency when companies talk about AI and machine learning. So we publish the number of data points we have, we publish the kind of data, where we get the data, and we always benchmark how our algorithms are working. Today we have 450 million data points. It's six months ahead of where we thought we were gonna be. Our current roadmap is almost to about 2 billion data points. So as we expand our team, we're looking for great new data scientists, uh, programmers, as well as algorithm people. Uh, so, you know, our goal is to get to that 2 billion data point as fast as possible. Um, I think we should be able to reach 1 billion probably in the next six to seven months and perhaps faster. So I'm very hopeful that the platform will become more and more powerful. But we point this platform not to become a tech company, but we're developing this platform to get drugs to cancer patients. So the core of what we're doing is we're trying to solve for all these unmet needs in cancer. The current portfolio that we have is in four programs. This is why investors are excited. One program is in phase two for metastatic hormone refractory prostate cancer. Again, as I mentioned, it's a subset of prostate cancer that's defined by a genomic signature. Uh, it has a very high death rate, and we believe our drug is very well tolerated. It's in the middle of the phase two trial today. Our second drug is in non-small cell lung cancer, which we're trying to point at never smokers. This is LP300. And again, this is a, um, a disease that is predominantly female. It's about two thirds of never smokers that get non-small cell lung cancer are women. That's global as well as in the US. They tend to not have a very positive outcome. They tend not to respond to pdl one drugs and they tend to have a totally different molecular profile for their uh, cancer than tobacco-based usage. So obviously it's a very different disease. And we believe that this never smoker population uh, there's a critical need to have an improved therapeutic option. Our third drug is LP184. That's in two programs. We're working with Georgetown, uh, with CTRIC in the UK. We also are working with Fox Chase Cancer Center. And this is an interesting drug that has nanomolar potency. Um, and it's, uh, again, from, it's a DNA damaging agent, but it only works to damage the DNA in cancer cells where there's a certain expression of a signature. So it works across all kinds of tumors, liver, ovarian, uh, pancreatic, also does work in prostate as we've seen, but we're focusing this where there's a signature and that signature correlates to this drug working. It works with nanomolar potency, which is pretty rare and unique. And this drug, because of its potency and also its blood-brain barrier permeability, it is a small molecule. It actually crosses a blood-brain barrier, has a very favorable score, and will work in CNS cancers Namely, we're pointing at a glioblastoma, which has a less than one year survival, but also, unfortunately, only about 50% of patients respond to TMZ, which is timzolamide, which is the primary um, uh, drug given in glioblastoma. So this has a great, again, very specific niche application in uh, patients that don't respond to the current standard of care. So even though we're going after uh, these very targeted patient segments, it still is comprised over uh, probably over a million patients globally with multiple billion dollars in therapy sales. And um, I'm going to skip forward a few slides. And as you can see, this is a very interesting slide because this drug failed the phase three trial. As you can see on the far left, it didn't have as much of an effect as it should have had in all patients in non-small cell lung cancer. But if you start peeling back the patients where it worked best, those patients in this cohort 
where 66 patients, female never smokers, were extended their life by over 125% in two-year survival rates. That's massive. This drug would have been approved if it were looking at female never smokers or never smokers, which also had a 125% increase. But at the time, there wasn't as much known about the molecular basis of tobacco versus non-tobacco usage. There wasn't a signature, and there weren't the precision medicine pathways that there are today to describe the differences and in response, but also the differences in patient selection. So this is, you know, we believe we're kind of at a new era around um, developing drugs, but really one of the things that we're accelerating isn't the targeting, but it's really the process of how we get there. And so both in new programs such as 184, as well as in rescue programs uh, like 100 and 300, we're using the engine to do work that takes years and do it hopefully in weeks or months and to do it with a much smaller team. Again, as I mentioned, radar is kind of core to our process. Uh, we use a number of different machine learning techniques. Right now, the, our favorite are multi-layer neural networks that can have very high statistical significance in terms of the generation of signatures, and also they can do, uh, be very efficient in terms of working across the data sets. We've looked at things like uh, random forest, scalar vector machines, uh, KRS regression. We've looked at all kinds of different machine learning alg algos. And in fact, we're actually starting a campaign now to look at convolutional neural networks of KRAS regression. And, you know, I'm very hopeful those will actually improve the efficiency of our algorithms because sometimes these algorithms can take days to run in the cloud and we want to bring that down to less than a day. Um, so as I mentioned, we're, we're constantly focused on improving two things. One is our internal efforts, but secondly, also our development of a companion diagnostic signature. So we want to also put in the hands of our pharma partners or when we commercialize the drug, a companion diagnostic that will allow you to select patients in the real world setting in hospitals and through labs to actually bring the patients in. Our entire company has a very significant intellectual property moat. We have 108 patents that have issued uh, that we've licensed in, but also seven patent applications that were developed across 14 families and we'll continue to, to develop our patent estate. Um, we're very aggressive on our patents, both for methods of use, on the signatures that correlate to drug sensitivity and response, and also for our radar AI platform. We have collaborations with world-leading cancer research institutions. We'll have additional ones up here uh, every few quarters, but you know, these include Sloan Kettering, NCI, Citric, Georgetown, Fox Chase. Uh, we're, we're, we'll announce one in Texas very soon as well, and another major one in the East Coast. So our peers, this is very important. Our peers in this space are all valued at several hundred million dollars. The two public companies um, that are out there are BioCell, which is now trading at over a billion dollars, has two drugs, one in neuro in CNS for agitation, and one in immuno-oncology, which is very early. The second company is Schrodinger, which has been around for some time, but they transformed from a software company to a drug development company. And they have five compounds, all in early stage development, much earlier than ours, and they enjoy almost a four plus billion dollar valuation. And so both these companies IPO'd um, recently by Upsell. Um, their underwriter was similar to ours, was Think Equity. When they did their um, underwriting, let me show you their stock, um, if I can pull up that screen share. Well, I won't bother you. But if you look at their stock, BioXL, the ticker is BTAI. They did a funding in um, uh, with Think Equity, which is who funded us. Their stock was trading at a low of around $4 at one point. They did a funding, I think it was around $6, $7. Their stock today is uh, over $50, $53. So really, uh, as it started exploding in January, going from 8 to 10 to 15 to 30 to 40, and analysts picked up on it, they realized that this company was rapidly developing uh, the drugs. They went from having assets in, not in phase two all the way down to finishing phase three in less than a year and a half. And that's because of the focus the team had in terms of using their platform. Similarly, Schrodinger, they went public uh, in February, and Schrodinger um, went public at around a 25 or so dollar valuation. They're trading today um, close to $95. So they went from under a billion in valuation to over 4 billion. So investors are very excited about this transformation. There are very few public companies. And that was also one of the reasons that drove us to look at the public markets. So I'm gonna um, 
shift now to talking a little bit about why I joined and um, kind of uh, a little bit about my background, if you guys don't mind. When I joined, oddly enough, I did not want to take this company public. I actually had left a public company, took some time off, and I thought, well, I would love to take this company and sell it privately. There are a lot of pharmas that want this kind of approach. Um, but then as I looked at the options to raise capital and what the cost of capital would be and what the kind of control we would have to give up, it was clear that the options to take it public and raise the next round of 25 to 30 million, we raised 26.3, um, was better to do it publicly than privately. So it came down to cost of capital and control over the franchise. Um, and I think that our investors would agree a much better outcome and allows us to raise capital in the future. There's of course downsides to it as well. You know, in a private round, once you stamp your valuation, you're done until the next private round, whether it be, you know, six months or two years or whatever the time frame is. But in the public market, obviously you uh, have all the ebbs and sways of whatever the sentiment and trading activity is. So that's, you know, that's good and bad. Um, but I think long-term investors are very interested. And as we get more exposure for the company, but more importantly, as we get more grouped with peers like BioCell and Schrodinger, I think the uh, stock will be an outperformer and go from where it's around today, around $13, $14, hopefully uh, closer to $40 to $50, um, and also give us opportunities to raise additional capital. The other great thing about being a public biotech or a public pharma company is that you get into the habit of giving a lot of transparency about your portfolio, your team, and your operations. So it makes it more comfortable for pharma companies or other larger biotech to want to do an acquisition, makes it a lot simpler for them as well. Um, so I think the future value of the company is going to be built around um, three very important areas. And then I'll turn it over to Q&A. One is our platform. I think as we publish more on our platform, It'll drive value. I think the second area um, will be our drug studies um, as we launch our phase one and phase two clinical programs. As we develop programs with pharmas using our platform or with their drugs in combination. And ultimately, as we publish the data of our clinical trials, it'll drive value. So we, we'll have readouts starting probably late this year or early next year. And then the third area in terms of building franchise value is the development of a killer management team. And so without the management team that I brought in, which includes our CFO, David Margrave, um, our chief scientific officer, Kishore Bhatia, our head of clinical development, Kerry Barnhart, and the commonality that all of these executives have is, uh, number one, they're all seasoned, seasoned biotech and cancer researcher executives. They all have 20 plus years of experience. Um, without them, we would not have been able to make this public offering happen. So. Uh, it's going to be the team. And that's the third franchise uh, point of value. So as we build a killer team, um, both in the data side and on the cancer development, uh, cancer biology side, it'll have a lot of value as well to other companies and uh, drive uh, franchise value and value with investors. So that's, um, I think, um, as much as I think I'd like to talk about, I'd like to really turn it over to answering questions that the other fellow entrepreneurs or um, uh, executives or others have uh, from Healthcat Wildcatters. Thank, thank you, Pana. Great, great presentation. Really, not easy to uh, distill it all down to uh, 20, 25 minutes and really tell the story. Um, 